You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER. We are Flex and Herds. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour on 2SER. And Herds, I am ecstatic to say we are at the end of Too Many Cooks. Look. And would you look at this? I know would what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. You're going to say you were right. You're going to say you get points. You get points. You get all the points. Take all of them. Throw them. I will. Throw this man's face. I will take all of these points, All right, what up, dude? Fine. It is a pleasure to be standing here before you, champion, once again of this murder mystery game. It's garbage. Oh. Why don't I even do this show? Come on. <laughs> there is no fair chance. There is no fair play in this mystery. That's all right. That's all right. Herds, I'll give you the honor of telling us telling us about the novel. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're doing Too Many Cooks. This is part three. This is chapters 14 to the end of Too Many Cooks by Rex Stout, featuring Nero Wolf, our oversized armchair detective. Yes. Uh, in this part, we will be talking about the, the final part of the mystery, whether it was fair, whether it wasn't, and uh, all sorts of fun stuff that goes along with that. So strap in for a, a good time. Uh, let's get into it. I'm very excited because not only herds, was this me being proven right once mm. again? Uh huh. <laughs> I can't Whatever. take I can't just, take myself seriously being going. that narcissistic. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. I'm I sorry. Know you well. <laughs> I know you well enough. Um. So, I think that the fantastic thing about this section of the book is that it's so short, but so much happens. Yes. Yep. We we go through so many different phases of the investigation so quickly, mm-hmm. but none of them catch you blindsided. Yep. It's a sprint, but it all builds on stuff that we've seen in the past. We're presented with this uh, this this cascade of, of clues and revelations upon clues, and a man who is Sol Panza, who is apparently from the previous books, and he is nothing if not an exposition machine. <laughs> he just churns out fact after fact after fact, and this is intentional as well. Yeah. This isn't you know a poor bit of writing. This isn't you know too much information being thrown at us. This is explicitly Nero Wolf's purpose after he's exposed Raymond Leggett as our culprit, as our criminal, and he says, what? You can't pin this on me. What are you trying to do, you sly? And then he says, Sol Panza, please take the stage. Yes. Would you speak to Raymond? Like, it's, speak to Leggett. <laughs> it's hard to comment on the role of Sol Panza because we haven't read the previous novels yeah. in the series. But the impression that we get yeah. of him is phenomenal. Yeah. He seems like the walking summary scene. Yes. You know how we have that scene at the end of the novel, which we do get in this one where mm. the detective sits everyone down and says, and you were the culprit. Yeah. Soul Panza is that scene with legs. Yeah. It's excellent. <laughs> He's a good parallel to Archie Goodwin, who is the literal legs of a detective. Yes, exactly. And now we have the legs of... The, the solution. Oh, I love it so much. And then we also get back to the more, you know, SS Van Dyne clinical detective sort of thing when Nero mm. Wolf tries to trick and uh, successfully, mind you, Dina Lassio oh, into unveiling so what's happened. Because it's become so obvious through the entire novel that Dina Lassio is involved very mm. closely with the crime. Yeah. And the way that Archie and Nero slowly press her to finally mm-hmm. confess yeah. is a very, very elegantly written passage. Yes. The psychology of the scene. B- because we could very easily have just had, you know, Rex out, so we could have just said, well, the criminals are Dina Lazio and Roman Leggett, clap them in irons, boys, and off they go. Yeah. But he instead, he spins this because we have a character who has done a murder and a character who is an accomplice. And so he presents this dynamic between them that is really only ever off camera before this, this scene. Dina Lazio is brought to the forefront and, and you know, Wolf says even, you know, if you tell us a version of the truth that suits yourself, perhaps, you know, you won't be tried for murder. Perhaps you won't get the ultimate punishment. And she completely falls for it. Yeah, it's, um, it's excellent. Yeah. And I think it's also a very important thing in the realism of yep. detective fiction to make sure that we actually have a confession of some sort, some evidence that will actually have someone clapped in irons. Yeah, this is the thing. We, Raymond doesn't get a chance to because he he won't. He won't admit to the crime. He says, even as he's being having the handcuffs put on him, he says, Tolman, this is going to be the end of your career. If you go through with this, that's the end for you. There is a really obvious moment to me. Well, there's a couple of moments where Leggett is showing his guilt and it's when he's trying to effectively bribe Wolf. Yes. Uh, in chapter chapter five, mm-hmm. he tries initially to, to you know, persuade Wolf to bring Barin onto his staff as a chef and he'll offer him a commission fee. And oh, yes. Do the, and that, you know, that's pretty, whatever, that's like background politics of the chefs and whatever is ha- that's happening there. I'm sure it has nothing to do with the murder of the nothing story. Nothing at all. But he comes back again and offers Nero Wolf $50,000 $50, in cash. $50,000 in cash. 
cash. Is that which, more than 11,000 francs? I have no clue. But we back probably in the day, have checked that. <laughs> back in the day, I know that this was a lot more than 50,000. Yeah, exactly. Inflation. Um, this is a huge amount of money mm. in cash. And like, if there was ever a scene to say, I have done a murder, please stop investigating my murder and please focus on this Berin thing instead, that's the scene. And this is something I know you love about Murder Mysteries, Herds, mm-hmm. is that it was a scene that brilliantly recontextualized a previous scene. You you have me right on the money. I was just about to say that. We we have a scene where, you know, Liget tries to offer an amount of money to the detective to get him to bugger off. He tries to kill the detective. And then he offers even more money. Like, if you put this into perspective of yeah. him as the culprit, that progression of action, mm. the desperation where he's, you know, he, he's begun with this lie of, oh, yeah. I was I was in New York. And, you know, maybe if you help me out here, maybe don't worry about the murder so much. Just get on your train, go home. I know you're only going to be here for two days. If I give you a distraction, maybe, maybe that'll be fine. But the logical progression that he goes through of getting more and more desperate as time goes mm. on, knowing that he has this time limit that, that, uh, that Wolf has even put on himself. Yeah. is exciting to watch. In the context of the traditional Ronald Knoxian rule that the culprit must be introduced in the early part of the story, mm. technically Liggett fits in. Technically. Technically Liggett fits in. I wasn't particularly yeah. happy with it, but I think that the execution with which his character was presented through the whole of the novel means I am a mm. lot less upset than I otherwise would be about sure. the lack of conventional fair play in this story. Yeah. Which I'm okay with. As we've said, this is something Rex Stout was all about. Yeah pun rhyme intended uh <laughs> he was very much more about the drama and the suspense and the action the romance you know he's an incurable romantic um less so about the fair play of the mm. detective mystery genre which you know as as we said on the previous episode i i do have a problem with but i think that, i don't i love it <laughs> yeah but i i think that going in so close-minded that i can't accept a well-constructed yeah. story like this would be foolish Sure. Um, you know, my initial reaction was still like, oh, really, it was the guy that wasn't there at all. But yeah. as we got through, and as you say, as we saw that escalation, mm-hmm. that brilliant background psychology yeah. of characters is one of my favorite parts of background characters in murder mystery mm. or just stories in general. You know, I know we saw the latest Spider Man movie, which <laughs> is a bit of a strange <laughs> example to bring <laughs> up, perhaps. <laughs> And Herds You're pandering to me. You're absolutely pandering. Absolutely love this one background the, character. You're trying to soften the blow from I taking am. my points, but I I'm am, okay I with am. it. Keep going. Yeah. He absolutely love this one background character because he was such an excellent parallel for what was going on in the main arc of the yes. story. And it really scaled down and humanized the main complications yeah. of the story. This, I, I won't spoil this character or anything about them, but there are they only have about, I would say, a minute total of functional screen time when they're like the focus because they just put these little tiny details they're just snapshots but they're so punchy and well done anyway this isn't a spider-man podcast but if it was i give that character 10 out of 10 i think it's kind of similar to when you look at you know model making in movies and the model makers always put in these tiny details that mean nothing to the audience but mean a lot to them and that's what makes the story feel authentic a lot of these background characters in this novel, even though in the end they don't actually have that much to do with it, all of their emotions are used effectively to convey what is actually going on in the story without demonstrating to you explicitly that it is the core of the story. And I think that is beautiful. Mm-hmm. None of the chefs actually end up doing the deed, which is kind of funny when we take the premise of there are, there are 15 chefs and one of them dies. Surely it's one of the other chefs. Not at all. I think if I had to pick a book out of any of the ones that we've covered on this show as the most accessible murder mystery, yeah. it would be a very tough call between this one and the three taps. I was going to say the three taps is, has a beautiful sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for a lot of the same reasons too, I really think that if you love murder mysteries or if you are not so sure about murder mysteries, this is either the good one to shill out to your friends mm. or an excellent one to get started with. That said, this one would definitely make the better movie adaptation, which is worth looking into. Mm, maybe we should. Maybe that's what death of the reader can become. A, what a, a movie a murder movie exactly we become a movie murder mystery the with gimmick just becomes m- that you and I kill each other every week Myers. and make like a 45 minute TV episode about it that'd be perfect but Can it's do that? the only people on the cast is you and me everyone else is just sock puppets I think I could do that I'll be honest <laughs> I feel like I had the skill set to do enough terrible voices that we could get away with that yeah that, that, sound, that sounds possible I'm playing wolf though I want to <laughs> I want to say it right now Nobody can be the large and live wolf better than me. Absolutely. I want to be Archie. There's no problems here. This is perfect. 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 We were in agreement with well, yeah, we'll see you next week I'll on TV. You. I'll see you on set. Let's go. Let's go. This is Death of the Reader. We are talking Too Many Cooks <laughs> by Rex Stout. 
and we will be back in just a moment. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER. We are Flex and Herds, and today we're joined by Callan Boys, national food and wine writer for Fairfax, and a food traveller after the heart of our dear Archie Goodwin, our Watson in this murder mystery game this week. Callan, welcome to the show. Hello. So, Callan, food is often a matter of passion for us, be it vehemently defending our favourite restaurants or sticking doggedly to the undeniable belief that everyone's mother is the best chef in the world. How can we safely discuss food without incurring a dagger in our back? <laughs> <laughs> Have a very good legal team behind you at the City Morning Herald. That's, a good one. that's, that's what I find yeah, that's works. <laughs> um, I also find it works really, really well to make sure you always say, tastes like, uh, reminds me of. Mm. It could be that kind of thing. You don't want to say anything that's too certain. Otherwise, you'll have restaurant legal teams come down you like a ton of bricks. That's if you give negative reviews. Right. Which Mm. we don't really do that often at, well, I don't say Fairfax Media anymore. Channel 9 is our new overlords. Mm. Or not even Channel 9, just 9. Ah, this is true. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's very rare we do negative reviews because we want to encourage people to go out and eat. Mm. If a restaurant's Mm incredibly bad. We just kind of don't write about it. We'd rather celebrate the good than throw shade on the bad. That being said, if something's really calling out for attention, like there was a restaurant today that opened in Melbourne Mm. or opened last week, we reviewed a day in Melbourne for the age. And I think it's just called pink, the restaurant and everything's Mm. pink. Uh And we scored that. The Melbourne reviewer scored at eight out of 20, Mm. which has been the lowest score we've done in a Fairfax publication in a long, long time. Was, was the meat pink? (laughs) <laughs> I haven't read the review yet. I just saw the score and I clicked on it. I was like, oh, that, oh that'll that be when I get home after deadline. I'm going to read that. But um, yeah, there was a lot of horrible looking things in there. Anyway, but look, you just, just, just don't be too much of a wanker about it. And at the end of the day, you're talking about food. You're not trying to solve the world's problems. Although some chefs might think they are. So, <laughs> well. Yeah. Do you often find that that's something that you have to keep in mind when you're writing reviews? Like if you've eaten a dish at a restaurant mm. that you weren't as much of a fan of, will you leave that out of the review if it you think it's an outlier? Or Yeah, totally. Look, I've been to a lot of restaurants in Australia mm. many times and a lot of the best ones, they all have their bad days. Mm. The job of a critic is to say, what is this restaurant trying to do and how well do they do it? So if the overall product is pretty bloody good, Mm. Mm. then that's what you need to talk about. If you've got one waiter that might drop some cutlery or splash some wine on your shirt or something like that, well, you kind of leave that stuff out unless you can tell there's a systemic problem across Mm. it. So if one dish is under-seasoned, yeah, maybe you can bring that out and say, well, you know, the the terrine probably could have done with more salt. Mm. But, yeah, you don't really want to – take a whole review down just because, you know, something missed a bit of bloody aioli on the side. Well, let's say that someone did miss a bit of bloody aioli on the side and then someone is found with a dagger in their back in the (laughs) kitchen with aioli on it. How do you as a reviewer treat that? (laughs) I I haven't dealt with too many deaths in the uh, kitchen. Well... No, I haven't. I don't. I can't remember no, the last um, time a Sydney <laughs> Sydney chef was murdered in their restaurant. No but, chefs have come after you wielding their their kitchen knives, their steak <laughs> knives, trying to hunt you down for giving a bad review. No, nothing like that. No, no. I'm I'm usually pretty pretty good, and uh, but I've I've look. I've definitely had some shade thrown at me online every now and again. I I've more so. I remember the time I most got in trouble of Sydney's chef community when I said the third best chicken sandwich in Sydney was the Zinger at KFC. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's bad and, for and I stand by it. I'd, mm-hmm. I think I still stand by that claim today. I haven't gone out and tested a lot of chicken sandwiches in the last two or three years since I wrote that. But you know, it was there was a dour time there for chicken burgers, and chicken sandwiches <laughs> in Sydney, and that was kind of the best. It's like, why can a fifteen-year-old kid make a better bloody chicken sandwich than half the chefs in Sydney? And I say chicken sandwich because I believe that a burger needs to have meat on it. Ground beef, beef, that's it. Mm-hmm. Anything else is a sandwich. Uh, and I know I sound like a wanker saying that, and I apologize. That's all right. You're a food writer. <laughs> that's the job. <laughs> now, you mentioned kind of the, the egos of some chefs and how you scarred them with KFC. Too Many Cooks, our book this week, is full to the brim with foodie egos from Rex yeah, Stout's yeah. 15 Masters of the Cooking World. Is the food world overflowing with such egos, or is it just a thing of the past, or was it just a concoction of our author this week, Rex Stout? 
No, there is a lot of egos out there. They're getting better at hiring uh, marketing and PR departments mm. to kind of tell them what to do when they talk <laughs> yeah, to people yeah. like me. But I still hear some pretty heinous stories from uh, behind the chef's line of what goes on in kitchens. Uh, but mo- look, it's probably better. It definitely is better than what it was uh five or 10 years ago, definitely better than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Mm. That boys culture, that brigade culture is slowly coming out of kitchens. But um, look, it's still certainly there and uh, in, in, a, in a lot of places. But look, gee, I mean, look, you've got open kitchens now mm. in a lot of places. That was never really a thing say 25 years ago. So you've really got to learn to uh, respect your staff and kind of put your ego away and just talk to people in a nice, mm. calm, serene manner mm. about what they might be doing wrong and then give them a good bollocking after service and say, <laughs> well, the customers have good, gone home. But look, I mean, with with chefs and, and ego these days, social media has opened up a whole bunch of opportunities to get out there and see what people are doing and learn from that and say like, oh, okay, well, I've been doing it this way for such a long time. Ah, this guy in like Copenhagen or yeah. this guy in Brazil or wherever it might be, which I had no access to that before. And I can currently see what's happening in real time in those restaurants all around the world. I think that's great to kind of dig bits and pieces of influence. Yeah. Without stealing dishes. That's one thing that chefs do get quite upset about. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Is if you steal a dish, like blatantly, and I am damn sure that there is a number of chefs, and I won't name them, in Australia that go through like cookbooks from like weird Scandinavian countries (laughs) and that kind of thing and just kind of like take, you know, bits and pieces here and there and think no one's ever going to know. Yeah. I mean, that's just like one of the main chefs in our story. Uh, Jerome Berin goes to great lengths to defend his recipe for, are you going to try to pronounce this one, Hertz? Uh, Saucisse Minui. Yeah. I hope. Hey, you've oh, practiced. I have. I've been learning since the first episode, my friend. That's great. <laughs> how, how was I out of 10? You're you're about 9.5, sir. So. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah, the yeah. highest price I can ask for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. No, you go. Yeah, no, you're right. One of the things, though, I tell you what, I, I mean, because you don't deal with chefs in restaurants too often when it comes to ego, waiter ego. Mm. That's oh, an issue. Ooh. And pronunciation is my big pet peeve. You know, it's when you, and especially wine. Like if I went with my dad and he's like, you know, he feels a bit like nervous and anxious being in a restaurant and he asks for the the uh, the cabinet, <laughs> <laughs> say, instead of cabinet. And then you've got the waiter that comes back to him and says, ah, oh, yes, the cabinet, sir. And then dad's with his family. He feels embarrassed and it's just not good. And, you know, I, I write about this all the time, but it still keeps happening. And so food pronunciation, especially French mm. restaurants, mm. but Chinese, everything, like it, it can be pretty bloody hard. So I think a, a good waiter should not want to, had that almost narcissistic streak to yeah. show like, oh, this is how you actually pronounce it. Is there any recipe these days that chefs are trying to crack that one restaurant in the past has had or one that has kind of been lost to the annals of history that they're trying to bring back? Oh, no, great, great question. Uh, I Not that I'm aware of. I th- think we're, we're really pushing the food to its 10th degree now and the whole... Um, I think what we're trying to do um, now and what I'm noticing, which is great, is with Australian ingredients. Mm, mm. We're a very young country in terms of post-colonial cooking. And, you know, Aboriginal cultures for years knew how to utilise these ingredients and manipulate them for taste. And and now we're just rediscovering all that kind of stuff now. So, like, that's where experimentation is going. So the world of Australian ingredients is really, really, really interesting. So people trying to how to crack, how to make those ingredients as tasty as they possibly can, that's what's that's what's fascinating. Because mm-hmm. you can't just pick up some Davidson plum or a bunion nut and it's going to be delicious instantaneously. You've really got to work a little bit hard mm. to to crack that. So, yeah, that's that's what I'm seeing a lot of. Um, and And... Yeah, but I think hopefully that whole idea of that fat duck style molecular gastronomy thing and mm. that's mm. kind of that's 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 going away these days, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> yeah. thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. It's just all about sourcing good produce and then what can you do to it to make it taste the most like itself, really, mm. and bring out its best and yeah. Well, all right. Callan, thank you so much for joining us here on Death of the Reader. If you want to catch Pleasure. any of Callan's food writing, you can catch him in Nine's publications such as at goodfood.com.au for those of you who aren't getting the newspapers here in Australia. Callan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. And we'll thank be you. back with Rex Stout's Too Many Cooks in just a second. Yeah. 
You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds. This is Pause for Effect. <gasps> Your murder mystery world tour. You're allowed to get away with that? Can we pause on radio? I think we can. I think we kicked off if we pause for too I, long. I think if we pause for yeah, if we pause for too long, they just start playing music over the top of us. Which we don't want. So we let's don't not want make that. it too long of a pause. Yeah. In fact, if we just say the word pause instead, I feel like that. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Murder Mystery World Tour, we're talking about too many cooks. This is the absolute final part of the final episode. Yes. We'd like to thank you for joining us. Talk about fair play. Yeah. Yeah. We've spoken the whole way through this book about fair play and the fact yeah. that Rex Stout was not a proponent of conventional fair play. Mm. And as always, if you want to know about the conventional rules of fair play in the detective fiction genre, you can catch that on the podcast online. Mm -hmm. Just search for extra. Yep. Talking about Knox's rules, talking about Van Dyne's rules, all that fun stuff. Um, making sure that the reader has the uh, proper tools to solve the mystery for themselves. But Rex Stout has no such concern, it No, seems. he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He'd rather make a good story, which I am okay so with. So, is this story fair? Yeah. I would give this, if I was to rate it on a scale of fairness from, you know, <laughs> 1 to 10, I would, uh -huh. I would give it a 6. It's okay. above average, yeah. but it's not, it's not stellar in terms of its fairness. And, okay, I think, Herds, that... Yeah. I think that this story has perhaps swayed my heart a little bit. I thought going into this right. when we got to the end of chapter six mm. that I was done for. I thought that we had abandoned fair play. We were. I thought that there was no culprit in sight because it didn't feel like anyone was particularly suspicious. No. But then Alberto Malfi came out of nowhere, out of seemingly nowhere, out of literally nowhere. <laughs> You're right. He doesn't have any business being in that scene except to say, what about the Zolotta guy? And it's like, who's Zolotta? Well, he was mentioned in the first part of the novel. He's, he might be important. No. No. He's a red herring. You know, if we look back at all of the clues, for example, as I stated in the previous episode, I said that if you look at all of the people that had motive presented in chapters one to six, all of the people that had motive to kill Philip Lazio were, you know, all disconnected. None of them really seemed weightier than one or the other. But the only person that tied them all together, other than Philip Lassio himself, mm. was Raymond Liggett as the sure. owner of Philip Lassio's workplace. Yeah, for sure. I do think that you could very easily make this uh, a proper fair play mystery. Yeah. I think that all you would really need to do is, uh, barring, you know, change the narrative yourself, but you could set it from the perspective of Nero Wolf. Mm. I think that would be very easy. A lot of the clues that we kind of talk about in the later chapters are things that Nero Wolf was aware of or was suspecting way back when, you know, he says, you know, this is something that Raymond Lee said. This is when he talked about the source print temps, yes. which was not mentioned in the newspapers. What a ridiculous which is, clue that was. Exactly. Because it, it's it's not an obvious one. It's a it's a hand wave remark. Yeah. It's something that Nero Wolf apparently, you know, draws attention to in his mind, but we're never really discussed on, on camera, so to speak, in the pages of the novel. And he gets confirmation of it when he has his telegram come yeah. over, which is also not explained to us. Yeah. The, the easiest way to make this fair play and also to follow the rules that we've kind of been looking at in the previous novels would be to say, here is Nirwal's process. He tells, even he tells Archie, you know, mm. this is why I said this telegram. This is what the telegram says because it's in the code and codes are kind of weird in murder mystery yeah. novels when you're not supposed to kind of solve them. But- Archie is such an entertaining perspective that yeah. I don't mind at all. No, for sure. Nero Wolf sitting in an armchair thinking about things for 17 chapters would be excruciating. I would be very interested, actually, in reading a novel which is purely set from the perspective of an armchair detective yeah. who never leaves the room and the clues are like, I heard a gunshot. Something like flew past, like a newspaper flies past the window, like covered in egg yolk. And they're trying <laughs> to like figure out based on these, you know, visual and auditory yeah, yeah, stimuli yeah. that they get within the room. Mm. Um, of course, that would be very silly. We should find that novel. <laughs> Maybe we should. Maybe we should. Yeah. But, you know, I think going back to the source print temps, it, it goes very much back to murder mystery short stories where yeah. a lot of murder mystery short stories have what are nearly grammatical clues. Yes. In yes. this one, the main clue that Nero Wolf banks on mm. is the fact that Raymond Liggett supposedly couldn't have found out that it was source print temps that they Supposedly. had to taste. Even though, like, it's the novel tells us that he went straight to Wolf, but 
there are there are people that you pass on the way yeah. through a spa and, house. And you let's know? let's be fair here. Yeah, yeah. He also supposedly wasn't in the town. Yes. <laughs> the day that the crime happened. Yes, yes. But that was a lie as well. So yes. it's not exactly as strong evidence as Nero Wolf makes it out to be. Mm. But I think that we as the reader can yeah. see why it's stronger than it might actually be in, yeah. in situ. And and of course, this is all in service of building the suspense and making it so that Nero Wolf's grand scene where he exposits and tells us all about who the culprit is and how he figured it out, it makes it that much more interesting. Yeah. Um, but and that's that's the balance, of course, is writing a murder mystery where we can appreciate the talent of the detective and they don't feel insufferable, you know, finding that balance there, which is a bit tricky so for some authors. <laughs> anyway, for some. for some one author maybe. Um, but yeah, finding that balance between a detective who tells everything to the audience, but and, and they can figure out who the killer is, but they just won't tell anyone explicitly who it is, you know. Finding that balance between suspense and 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 annoyance, I think, mm. is very uh, very difficult. Yeah. Um. And this novel does sacrifice some of that fair play in order for Nero Wolf to be a little bit smarter and for us to be in the dark a little bit longer. I think that one of the other most important aspects to consider about this novel is that it's not the first one in its series. It isn't necessary for these authors to actually go through and make each story accessible mm. as its own. I sure. know that one of our listeners has actually complained to me that <laughs> Agatha Christie is particularly guilty of spoiling her own stories in later books in, uh, in her own series, yeah. which is one of the difficulties with getting into her stories. And I think Sir Arthur Conan Doyle does that as well, but I it's it's been a while since I've been over that, so I can't say <laughs> for sure on that front. But, you know... I think that there is a certain value to the completely isolated serialized stories like this where I'm sure if you were a well-read Rex Stout fan, you would be able to spot hints and jokes about past books yep. in yep. this one. But at the same time, the fact that you were able to jump in anywhere in the series and have such a good time like we did with this novel yep. is excellent. Yeah, finding something of value in a long series like this is, I mean, it's incredibly valuable. Um, it's... Like, if you were to jump into a long book series, or, or a, I should say a series with a lot of long books, like The mm. Lord of the Rings or Frank Herbert's Dune, um, series like that, you would have a hard time getting into the characters. Yeah. You know, if you didn't read Fellowship of the Ring, you'd be like, what's this ring doing here? Who are the orcs? <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, one of the challenges for us is that we have to find the books that do fulfill that role. Yes. Where we can say... You know, this is the book we're covering for the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. This is what we think you can do. If we jump into the middle of a series and they spoil the previous six books in the series in the opening. Or somebody's com somebody else's series. Yeah. Van Dyne. Van Dyne. Looking at you, sir. <laughs> Still upset about that. <laughs> His ghost will haunt us. His ghost continues to haunt me. <laughs> but yeah, Herds, I think it's it's pretty obvious from what we've been talking about that this this story... It's not completely fair, but no, it's no, also not. not what matters. I mean, look, that's all right. I know this will surprise many people, but even I had picked out who the who the culprit was. In what this one, you know, I couldn't quite figure it what? out. What? Who do you think it was? Look, I might have thought it was Melfi. Because that's fair. Because he fair. runs around and he talks to people, and he he's is... like, "Oh, it was Zoltar, or whatever yeah, his name was. He, Zolana, that's his name." He does seem very evil. I mean, yeah, just the way that he's running around and they talk about Corsican stabbing each other, and he's an actual active participant in the story. You know? Yeah. He shows up out of nowhere, but he's just a henchman. Mm, no, absolutely. I, I, I can sympathize with that choice. I nearly made that foolish error myself, Herds. Yeah. But fortunately, I survived in the end. That's all right. Maybe the next novel I'll have better luck. <laughs> Flex, you want to tell us about the next book? Yeah, Herds. I'm very excited for this one. Why we so? We are finally, finally escaping the golden age of murder mystery. Yay. What country are we going to? We're going... Halfway between America and Russia. What does that even mean? It's an American author who's from Russia. That's amazing. Where's this novel set? Tell us about it. The future hurts. The future? Oh, it's not a where, it's a when. Yes. Oh, I'm so excited. Herds, you might have heard of this arguably iconic author by the name of Isaac Asimov. <gasps> That's the robot guy. That's the robot guy. Oh my goodness. What? Yeah. The three laws of robotics themselves will be the next set of rules that we'll be covering on this okay, show. Okay, I'm down As for that. As we delve in to Isaac Asimov's 1954 novel, <gasps> The Caves of Steel. The Caves of Steel? Yes. Are we going to space? We will be going kind of to space. <laughs> we have a okay. robot, we have a robot detective, <gasps> we have a human detective. What? We'll be covering chapters 1 to 6 and herds <sighs> I am so excited to delve into sci-fi murder mystery. 
I'm so ready. I love sci-fi. This has been Death of the Reader. We hope you've enjoyed Too Many Cooks by Rex Stout as much as we did. We'll see you next week. 